Blackmailing, blackmailing. <laughs> Ooh, blackmailing. That's that's the sound that you should start a show always oh, on. Oh yeah. go like clack clack, and then it starts. <laughs> That would be so sick. You know, I think it just started. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. Ah, there was a sound. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good idea. It's like the, the film, the filming where they're like, okay. but instead. It's like a chuck. We yeah. call it chuck in Italy. Yeah. But now we just really yeah. started yeah. things. Brilliant. My man, Steph Bastian. Technically it would be Bastian. Damn. But it's okay. All right, let's start over. Steph Bastian. Awesome. You sound very French. I can see you spend some time with Teal. Yeah. Yeah. We had the podcast not too long ago, so mm. he's rubbed off on me a little bit. Let me say that this equipment looks sick. Yeah. You like I it? I feel very professional. <laughs> yeah, man. It's funny because before you were seeming a little, you know, uh, iffy about the whole situation. You're me? Like, yeah. You're like, ah, oh, what is this, you know, second rate bullshit I have to do? No, no. Fuck it. Fuck it. It was positive. But now that I see this, like, whoa. Uh-huh. I feel like in a talk show. Yeah. We're sitting on a couch, drinking my gin tonic. Mm -hmm. I'm like a king. Yeah. Yeah. You are a king. Oh, thank you. you. It's good that you're here. It's good that you're on this podcast with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Super nice. I guess I have a little bit of a a question for you. Uh Uh-huh. It's it might be Just a little bit. Yeah, it's I don't I'm trying to think of the words to to phrase this in, but it might be a criticism. I hope you're open to criticism. Not at all. <laughs> of course. The one criticism I have is that you did this uh, project mm-hmm. with uh, the Bent Back Girls. By project, you mean? Like the Yokai Bent Back Girl. The book, yeah. The book, yeah. yeah. But you didn't give us time to take it all in before you hit us with the Matrioska. This is the criticism. You hit us with two things. That were freaking awesome. That Thank you, thank you. I can't even get over from one side to the other. Tell me, why did you cram it in so close? I got, I got a lot of ideas. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I'm not missing. Now, maybe one out of a thousand is decent, right? But I got like millions. Mm-hmm. You're like, bah, 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 and I need to get them out. Otherwise, I go insane. It's like, oh, this thing and this thing. And then oh, many of them make no sense. You know, but someone was like, oh, this actually could evolve into something. The book and the exhibition... There are ideas that are born without an intention behind it. I mean, you're just born, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, well, what about this? And then it naturally evolves into something else, into something else, into something else. And I I tend to think bigger and bigger and bigger. So he starts as an idea, and then it becomes a drawing, and then it becomes an illustration, and it becomes a poster, and then it becomes a series of six posters, and then it becomes a book, and then it becomes an exhibition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's how it happens. So same thing with the Matrioska thing. It was born actually in the kitchen of Royal talking with Karen, talking uh-huh. shit like we always do. And then it became like a series of artworks and then inviting friends and this and that. And then it, it became what it is. Yeah. So it's really not planned any of it. You know, it just like comes and it grows organically. And, and I, I said this somewhere else, like I think that any good project has to evolve organically, mm-hmm. which means you can't force it. You can't sit down and be like, oh, okay, what are we going to do? You know, like it has to just be spontaneous yeah and then if the idea is good and then it grows on its own then you know it's going to be authentic Mm -hmm. you know what i mean so it just it just happens yeah i I definitely agree with that Mm. definitely over the the past when we're making artwork for certain people anytime you set out and say i'm going to make the best thing anybody's ever seen as soon as that statement comes out it's the biggest pile of shit that ever comes out yeah man like before before coming back here you, you mentioned the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of my favorite books, mm-hmm. which is this like Hinduist sacred text, mm-hmm. text or part of it. And in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a, is, a, is a part which is one of my favorite, which you can apply to us, but you can apply to many, like pretty much virtually to everything. And he says, at some point, Krishna says to Arjuna in the book, which are the two protagonists, to the main characters. And then he says, you're entitled to the work, but not to the fruits of mm-hmm. the work. Yeah which translated, for example, this situation, it means you're, you're about to do an artwork, you're about to do a tattoo, you're about to do whatever. You should focus on the fact that you can do that and, and you do it because you enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't focus on what that's going to bring you because otherwise you're doomed from the start. Yeah. And we all fell into this little trap, so to say. I caught myself sometimes being stressed and I was like, why? 
And then you realize that subconsciously, for example, lots of people, maybe they will recognize themselves in this. You're doing an illustration, you're doing a painting, whatever you're doing. And then you're really thinking, even subconsciously, when you're going to post it, what you're going to get out of it, mm-hmm. the followers, the likes. And that means that your thing is doomed from the start because you're focusing on the wrong thing. Right. So then when if you step back a little bit, you should enjoy this just for the fact that you're allowed to do this, mm-hmm. you know, and you tattoo, you draw your pain first place because you love that. You love the paper, you love the water, you love the oil, you love the skin sure. and not because of what's going to bring you because otherwise you're focusing in the wrong place and, and mm-hmm. you vibrate in the wrong frequency. Yeah. You know? It's like that saying where, um, you know, the purpose of a song or a dance is not to get to the end of it. Yeah, it's like it's the journey. Mm-hmm. It's all about the journey. Yeah. And, and I realized this even more, apart from, from the books, apart from the podcast, apart from the thing that you, you know, you read and stuff. But when I dislocated my elbow like two years ago or something at Jiu-Jitsu, mm-hmm. and I couldn't work for, for three months, I couldn't even hold a pencil. I yeah. couldn't like do anything with an arm. Mm-hmm. That makes you realize a lot of things. And then you go back to tattoo, you know, and then mm-hmm. you realize, oh, this is the point. You just love the feeling of it, you know, on in your hand to hold that thing and to, you know, to paint, to draw, to tattoo. Mm-hmm. It brings you back to the, to the real thing, which is that and not like, especially today, you know, like is misunderstood for what's going to bring you, you know, mm-hmm. the validation, blah, blah, blah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a bunch of different reasons. Yeah. But the funda- fundamentals is, is always about the art, mm. but I definitely get caught in that of making it for a certain reason. But all yeah, that all stuff do. Come, like it's, comes uh, and goes. It's how the human brain works, mm-hmm. you know? As well, like, we mentioned, like, validation. That's one of the main engines. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, like, this need for validation that brings you in doing certain things or saying some things for mm-hmm. the wrong reason. And not just about tattooing. You even go out at night. You want to shine in a group. You say something just sure. so other people like you, you know? Mm-hmm. Just how that ego works. Right. Yeah. You spend a lot of time kind of navigating through that in tattooing, like, the, this type of thought process in general i would say Mm -hmm. in general i I try to spend a lot of time to yeah to try not to sound pretentious but just like to to try to achieve the best version of myself sure and uh i don't know if you will ever get even close but it's about (laughs) like personal it's about the journey really you know it's about enjoying the process you know Mm -hmm. but yeah that means like reading means a lot of like a self-analysis you Mm -hmm. know to be mostly it's all about awareness sure being awareness of your mental process of why you do what you do. So pretty much what you do, say and think, you mm-hmm. know, is aligned to this yeah. to this kind of... Uh... So for me, I, I mean, I'm on that same wavelength because I usually have like a daily, nightly type of routine where I'll kind of like go through the day at the end mm. and let, like kind of review things. What do you do? Things. What's your routine? Just kind of play back the day at the end of the night. And just think of things of like, Maybe I fucking hurt someone's feelings or, mm. you know, said something I didn't want to. Or even that thing of being like, oh, I said something because I want that validation, like you were saying. Where I find myself not being the self that I want to be and compromising myself. And then if I have certain character traits that I'm working on that I want to like beef up or get better, I kind of look at those and each day... I see like, oh, how did I do for that day? And then the next day, that's the goal I shoot for the next day. And it's never perfect, but it's like in the practice of doing that, you become better. I was reading something today about that, like those like silly quotes, but some of them, you know, when you think about, and it was saying something along the lines, like forget the mistake, remember the lesson, Mm, Yeah. you know? And that's the thing, instead of like beating yourself up and be like, oh, fuck, I did that, oh, da, 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 and then you... And then you start the old guilt mechanism, which is mm-hmm. very twisted. We won't go into that, but this is a very uh, interesting question, which is from a podcast I was listening the other day from like Jim Quick, is like a memory expert. Okay. And uh, he was saying, which he didn't come up with this, but where is the gift? You know, so when you say about that, like, oh, today I did this, I heard somebody's feeling and stuff like that, I was like, okay, something inherently bad, or, you know, it sounds like it. But then you're like, okay, what is the gift in that? Mm-hmm. And that's the lesson. Right. So then you're like, okay, what can I learn from this and then improve tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know, and be like, hmm. Yeah. You know? It's all relying on a bunch of different scenarios too. Because I find like, for me, I have to have like certain things in play, enough sleep, well-fed, exercised, all these things. Because mm. by that alone, I can kind of make better decisions. 
and I'm already kind of in a better wavelength or mindset. If I'm overtired, overworked, stressed, then I'm going to most likely fall into certain traps where... Yeah, I mean, that that influence. I realize, especially now with the lifestyle that I have, which is very hectic, Mm because I'm on the road in a moment, so I change country literally every week. So it's (laughs) really, there is no ground for grounding. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But... I realize now even more the importance of routines, Mm -hmm. you know, which I really, really believe in. And they really grind you in the sense that even on a mental level, if you have those routines, those healthy routines, so to say, they really grind you and gave you like stability. So then your mind is more set and you feel you have some ground to express your best judgment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you miss those, it's really... Yeah, it's the same thing. Like when you when you're too too wild, you know, then then you might make misjudgments and stuff. Yeah, out of balance. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. That's that's uh, really tough. What are your routines? What are my routines? Mm. What's Every, Brian's secret? My my secret. <laughs> so everything starts in the morning for me. Yeah, I have to get up and I try very hard not to look at the phone until I've woken up. Mm. I don't want any sort of outside influence. Do you know that actually can't. You can totally fuck up your cognitive uh, function functions yeah. with the phone. Yeah, the phone. Yeah, like the old reward system. Uh-huh. But sorry, I keep going. I heard an interview with Tom Waits. Tom Waits was saying that when he has his musicians come in to record, he he makes sure that they don't watch TV or listen to music on the ride from the studio, and he starts first thing in the morning. I kind of take that, and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. If I don't want any outside influences, I'm going to not pick up the phone, maybe not read the news right away or anything like that. And I always try to have some book. Once I've woken up, had tea or coffee, breakfast, I sit and read for, I don't know, like an hour or so. And then if I get inspired from anything like that, uh, then I try to like take that inspiration and put it into the day. What are you reading now? Uh, right now I'm reading the news. <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. When I go back to the States, I'm going to try to pick up some books. But we were talking earlier about that book, Sapiens. Mm. That might be on the list to get. You um, definitely should get into that book, man. It's mm. so good. There is not one friend that we spoke, or whatever, not necessarily friends, no person that I spoke with, and they were like, oh, damn, that book, I started it, and it was so bad, like, no way. Mm-hmm. It gets you so hooked up. Let me let me mention it by this guy, which name is very hard to remember, Yuval Noah Arari. Yuval Noah? Yuval Noah Arari. And, but anyway, Sapiens, they sell it anywhere, mm-hmm. literally. And it's it's so good. Yeah. That book is so good. It gives you so much perspective. And the best thing is that he made this, Two books, a friend of mine, good friend, said that he made a third one, mm-hmm. Sapiens, which is Sapiens, a brief history of humankind, and then the second one is called Homo Deus. And basically, in Sapiens, he tells you in, in a very factual way, uh, under an historical, anthropological, cultural point of view, so very kind of like scientific, mm-hmm. how human society was created from Neanderthal, how Sapiens took over all the Neanderthal and blah, blah, blah. And we can get into that if we start talking about <laughs> mushrooms and post-stamets uh-huh. and, and uh, psilocybin. They talk about that in the book? No. Okay. That's something else. That's that stone. And uh, there is this very interesting podcast. I digress a lot. There's an interesting <laughs> podcast with Paul Stamets, which is a mycologist. Oh, man. I, I went down about, a rabbit hole with him. <laughs> you did, man. You did. And he tells you how psilocybin, he thinks, is responsible for the leaping consciousness. Mm-hmm leading to homo sapiens but anyway that's so, a mckenna thing yeah terence mckenna is all the same people mm-hmm. so this sapiens book basically tells you you know how we evolved and how money was created and pi was created religions and it's very factual but it gives you perspective you know people complain about terrorists blah 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 blah. the world is going to shit i hear this a lot you mm-hmm. know like oh the world is like no when you start looking at the numbers uh, there is another very good book from steven pinker called how is it called enlightenment now Mm-hmm. And then he talks facts. When you look at the numbers from the start of the century till now, poverty has gone down, famine, disease, whatever, you know, like plagues and stuff. Mm-hmm. Everything went down. So we're living in a very, very good time, right? And it gives you a lot of perspective. So, for example, talking about the terrorists, it was like, yeah, I think in 2012 or something, like 400,000 people died for terrorism and 3 millions died for overeating. You know, so it's like, okay, well, what kind of society are we living in? You know, and people's like, ah, oh, the world is not so bad, actually. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, anyway, it's very, very good. Like, give it a try, and then you tell me. Yeah, I'm always on a search for a new book, but 
So I start with that. I try not to sound like it's some weird spiritual thing. It's it, For me, it's very practical things. Mm-hmm. So I just sit for like a half an hour and just don't think of anything. Yeah. Some people call it meditation, but yeah. and then start my day. Because with that, like I feel I'm kind of tuned into the day. Yeah, focused. I'm not taken over by any sort of fear of what's going to happen that day mm. or anxiety of stuff that I have to do. And and that usually kind of keeps me out of trouble and makes me make the right decisions. Because usually if I wake up late and I, I got a foot out the door right away, that's when I'm more susceptible to getting influenced by other people. Mm. What people are saying kind of will get on my nerves and annoy me. That type of stuff gets me wearing like a bulletproof vest in a way it's kind of like calibrating mm-hmm. you know yeah so then you, then you like a tool that is well calibrated if you're out of a uh, sink mm-hmm. yeah i think it's important yeah i think it's like suiting up for the day or whatever mm. yeah. but you were talking about jujitsu i've done jujitsu for a while as well and my professor was always like choke out your problems kind of like a metaphor that's for, good you know not f- fighting head on yeah. but like kind of creeping up beside it getting behind it and just yeah. not always having to face things face to face i guess <laughs> yeah. like i was talking recently with the, with a guy that i tattooed i used to train at the same lab he trains at we're on two different levels you know like mm-hmm. i'm nothing he's gonna world champion level i was mentioning that guy joshua yeah and then he was telling me while i was tattooing him that he went training in Stockholm and then in and with some norwegian dudes as well that at the moment i can't remember the name but it's basically a bunch of norwegian guys that created their own their own label whatever Mm -hmm. so they fighting and training under that he was saying that they're very young seven eight year less of experience and training than others and they're killing Hmm. and he was saying that their secret is because they their whole philosophy it's a lot about mindfulness Mm. so he was saying that their training goes a lot around the whole mindfulness concept the being present and stuff Mm -hmm. like that and he was telling me how is really paying off practically because they're like going around and like destroying everybody, right. you know? And and so he said that that's a the winning theory, you know? And and we were discussing this in the fact that I totally agree because who can control his mind is the mightiest of the warriors. Mm-hmm. So it's all about that. So right. And jiu-jitsu especially, but I mean any any martial arts, you know, yeah. especially jiu-jitsu where you need to keep like a cold mind. If you can master that. Yeah, th- there's a certain kind of feeling that comes over you when someone's trying to strangle you and you just kind of feel relaxed i'm I'm nothing in jiu-jitsu i have a very very shallow you know practice not like you but so you know how to get strangled i know how to get strangled very well <laughs> <laughs> i'm like a black belt to get strangled <laughs> but the best thing that i got out of it until i stopped because of the injury apart from techniques and this and that what it gives you it gives you the ability of being cool-headed mm. under pressure jiu-jitsu is all about that i think pressure and it's not like i've done some boxing i've done some mma it's no like those sports where even with the pressure but you can make distance you know and you can time and with jiu-jitsu you can't mm-hmm. because it's like an octopus it's, you can't go anywhere you can't even take like half centimeters and the thing is it goes to a very primal level where basically they are getting your ability to breathe mm-hmm. they're taking that from you so i think that that's the more primal the most primal feelings and you really feel like you're dying mm-hmm. yeah you feel like you're drowning you really feel like you're dying mm-hmm. and the cool thing is that when you start the first times you tap right away right. because you're not used to it. But then when you start getting used to it, mm-hmm. it's great because they're like, okay, this is just my brain telling me this. Right. There is a guy, Dave Goggins. I don't know if you know about this guy. Mm-mm. He's like a black dude, ultra marathon guy. He's mm-hmm. very interesting and very funny because the guy is so hardcore. Look it up on YouTube. This guy, he does like all sort of extreme stuff. And he says, when your brain is telling you that you're done, you're actually done only 40%. Mm. Right? Well, oh yeah because your body is trying to protect you yeah it's, it's like a survival mechanism mm-hmm. but it's just lies you know yeah so when you when you get that under control in jiu-jitsu then you start being like okay and that's the real thing starts when mm-hmm. you start thinking like chess because you just like chess so and again i'm talking about about this from a very you know beginner point of view but this is what i got out of it you need to keep that cool mind and be like okay this is a lie you shut up that part of the brain and be like, I can still breathe. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's reduced, what's the next move? Yeah. And that's the best thing you can use in life because, mm-hmm. you know, when you have a problem, then you just start thinking solutions in, instead of freaking out. Right. The moment that you're trying to think as well is, is when it's too late. Mm. I've found that in many situations where I catch myself thinking. Yeah. That's when I'm in retreat or defense mode. Because you become self-conscious. Yeah. But, yeah. but also 
you've hit a spot where you can't surmount in a way. What you need is a bunch of rehearsal. That's why we do like so many different drills mm. is that we pound it into our head so it's more like muscle memory. Mm. You might feel somebody brush their hand next to your lapel and then you automatically go to block the neck and the moments it's that I'm best at that and the best at life or best in tattooing or drawing, painting, whatever it is, is when you're no longer thinking of it where it's just more of that kind of flow. A friend of mine, like a very good boxer, is one of my best friends, he has like two national titles. He was telling me how Bruce Lee used to say, at first the punch is just a punch. <laughs> then you learn a lot of things and then the punch becomes limitless solutions. And then after you learn everything there is to learn, a punch is just a punch. <laughs> It becomes like like just yeah muscle memory like you say mm -hmm. you know, the ten thousand hours of practice and yeah but it's all it's all similar to what I hear what like that Zen is people talking about getting into a state of Zen where they're in this no mind type of thing mm -hmm. so I whenever I think about drawing or painting it's always in that type of moment where I'm trying to think of how this is going to end up is when it's already corrupted. It's like, yeah, I have to kind of get to that point where I don't have to think about it anymore. This like thing that keeps on coming back to me of like trying to get to that point in, in everything, really. Yeah, the no mind, yeah. Yeah, you know, it doesn't have to do with art, but that moment where you're just happy where you're at. Yeah, you're just present. Yeah, exactly. To be present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Enjoy, and, and yeah, and you get there by enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking of everything else, mm -hmm. where this is going to go, how could I do it, how could I have done, you know, like... yeah. Yeah, all the sidetracks, like just being the moment. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of the times that you end up talking yourselves out of doing something that could be great is when you start thinking of like, oh, how am I going to do this? How mm. am I going to pull it off? Usually it's just starting. It's so funny, man. Like you mentioned the, you know, the, the, the Matryoshka project. Mm -hmm. One thing that I learned from this project this last year is that 99% of the limitation that we have, like you say, how am I going to do this? And then you fail. Mm -hmm. It's just in our head. I always had these lots of ideas. And then at some point I've been frustrated because I could not express them. I felt that I had a good life, a good place, a good salary, a good job in a, in a prestigious place and whatever, a good life. But I was frustrated because I have all this idea and I'm like, I'm doing nothing with those. You mm -hmm. know? And we are different the way I am. I need to express those because otherwise I feel I feel choked. But I always believe that, oh, in order to do this, I need to get the approval of this person or I need this person to make me in contact with that or I need... And now I realize after doing this, like, that's so bullshit. Yeah. You know, that's just, all those limitations are in your head. And then when you believe that and you start doing it and you put that thing in motion, then you realize, oh man, I did it. How did I do it? You just believe in it, put determination, put, put the work and then just roll. And I think people, when they see that, they're attracted to it and want to help as well. When they see like what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think that if you if you are on the same frequency, mm -hmm. I don't want to sound too hippie because at the end of the day, it's just labels. You know, yeah, you can call just, it this, you can call it that. It's just a way to call it. I think that if the basic idea is good, and especially if it comes from the good place, that's what we were saying. Mm -hmm. If it comes from the good place in the sense that you're doing it not because you're in a mindset of taking, but you're in a mindset of giving. Mm -hmm. So instead of like, okay, I'm doing this because then I'm going to get this, like you're going to sense it, you know? So the whole thing is going to feel wrong. Mm. But if you come from a good place and you authentically do things just because you love it and because you want to put people together, make an idea happen, and then possibly help somebody, whatever, I think that that sets you in a state that resonates with other people. And if other people are in the same frequency in the same mindset that they're gonna jump on it because they're gonna feel oh yeah i i, I can i can identify with that cool mm -hmm. yeah we'd like to help and that would happen with this project people just uh, got together you know? anybody that hasn't heard of this you had the unveiling or the show at the london convention that just passed yeah, 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 yeah. and how many artists in total did you have participate in the at the end or? at the end it was six to six it was supposed to be more but what i realized is that in such a in a project of this magnitude you have a lot of factors coming in mm -hmm. and uh you cannot predict all of them and the most unpredictable is the human factor yeah which means that you can organize stuff you can replace things you can switch schedules because there are so many artists involved from all over the world and they will have different situation 
then things can happen like family stuff, work stuff, personal problems, you know. So at the end, you always have like a percentage of dropout. At the end, it was 66. And it was from from lots of places like States, Australia, Canada, everywhere in Europe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And tell, tell us what was, I guess, asked of us to do yeah. Yeah, um, as far as making me use matryoshka. Yeah. So basically... I got like a set of matryoshka, which is those Russian nesting uh, nesting doll. Nesting doll. Yeah, nesting. So nasty. <laughs> nasty. Nesting doll. So nasty. These Russian dolls, which is those uh, those Russian dolls that you open and there is like a smaller one, a smaller one, a smaller one. So there was a set made of three and I sent, uh, I personally sent a set of three to each artist. Mm-hmm. So basically you were asked to be, to decorate that doll, and uh, but in total freedom, which means any, any, any subject you wanted, any technique you wanted. Uh, my idea was just uh, to see how you would solve the structural puzzle because it's 3D, it's wood. You had to be, you, you had to see how they would look from different angles. So it's a bit of a puzzle. Mm-hmm. And then you have three of them in this sequence of you know size, which means narrative. So let's see what narrative you're gonna choose. You're gonna tell a story, or you're gonna just like whatever. You know. Mm-hmm. So that was my question. It's like, okay, let's see how you're gonna solve it. And Everybody that tried it, now they know how tricky that was. And the interesting part is, if you tried it and you know what took to break this puzzle, then you get even more curious and be like, what did the other people do? Yeah. You know? So because you did one, now you know, it's like you can appreciate what other people came up with because like, oh, wow, I never thought about that. You yeah. Know? yeah. So that was the cool thing because it was a was a bit different challenge for everybody and mm-hmm. and people came out with the crazy stuff yeah you know and if you've seen it which you can actually see it still on the instagram page which which is matryoshka project but to spell matryoshka is very tricky <laughs> so if you go on my page on the bio and mm-hmm. then there's a link because matryoshka is very tricky it's, it, it's a m i t r y o s h k a underscore project uh-huh. so it's a bit tricky yeah, I really enjoyed seeing the people that did some extra sculpting. There was one that was like uh, porcelain, or it looked like porcelain. That's Florian Santos. That was a genius. That was yeah. incredible. And it, it was like a, a legit trompe l'oeil type of paint job in a way, where mm-hmm. it looked like a polished porcelain mm-hmm. and then broken. Yeah, because he painted inside and put a varnish. And I was working at his shop recently in Paris a few weeks ago. And he's actually undertaking uh, ceramic paint, ceramic classes, not only painting. At the moment, he's actually making the ceramic himself. And it's something that come. I think he had some art mm-hmm. background. He used to do that stuff. And now he's back to it. I see now where that comes from, you know, because he's yeah. taking this. And this is what I love, the fact that you you bring that other stuff to the game. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have this passion. And you're like, now you're bringing this to that project, which has nothing to do because it's wooden dolls. And I'm like, Oh, that's what is clever. Mm-hmm. Another one that's worth a mention is Emma Kerjek, which is from Aurora Tattoo in Lancaster. And she did this. She's a good friend of mine, so I've seen the whole process because she would send me like these Skype uh, videos and stuff where she sculpted the doll and she made the outer doll looking like a dome. Mm-hmm. And I've seen what went into that. I don't know how many hours she spent on that thing, man. Like, But I've seen what, what went into it and she made like a cardboard model of the geometric shape in order to sculpt it's like insane man it's like almost yeah. like mathematics and i'm like Whoa. but if it's the same insane. if it's the same woman that i remember she also did like the the madonna on... in, yeah the second one inside of the yeah. dome was a madonna that was incredible and the third one was a sacred heart made of i think plastiline or super sculpty it, it was insane man it was insane. it was absolutely because of like so many techniques involved so the the craftsmanship that went into it was insane mm-hmm. you know when i did it i struggled <laughs> everybody did man everybody I spoke to apart from two people apart from only two mm-hmm. her and another one that said oh i really enjoyed it you know I but bet. everybody said dude i hated it yeah. some people lots of people dropped out you know uh-huh. like they gave up but everybody said dude i hated it and myself i did it like i think seven times Really? I sended it and then redid it and then resended it and then did it and then it was Mm -hmm. ridiculous. It was ridiculous. For me, I was on the fence of doing watercolor or acrylic, but all I had was liquid acrylic. All right, we'll paint it with liquid acrylic. (laughs) 
yeah man whatever, whatever. It, it worked but i i was afraid that i wouldn't hit deadline if i did in oil paint because mm. i'm so rusty with it i was like ah maybe it's going to take too long it's not going to come out right and i stuck with something i knew it was going to dry fast but yeah. even that was difficult i tried it all yeah and i ended up using super sculpty <laughs> and the funny thing is let me tell you this. It is funny. There is one guy, which he was in the project. His name is Aaron Barton. Uh-huh. He's, he's very good, man. He's, he's a guy from UK working at Fuda Sheen. He's a very good artist. I, I, I seen this guy painting in digital with markers, with oil on, on silk, on paper. Like, you name it. He do it. You know, he does it. He's insane. So he's in the project. He made, he made this doll, which was technically incre- like crazy. And then he sent me the doll wrapped in this cloth. People send me like all sort of shit, plastic papers, bubbles, mm-hmm. shoe boxes, like you name it, piñata looking box, like <laughs> ridiculous. Like, so this guy sent some wrap, I was like, okay, you know, it's just not, so it doesn't get scratched or something, cool. And then it had like a cool pattern, so I needed a bandana to put on my doll because I made it look like a face. Uh-huh. So I was like, okay, I'm going to put a bandana because it's a Japanese character. So I put this bandana, I was like, so perfect. And I'm like, dude, by the way, I sent him a message. I hope you didn't mind me using this. Thank you very much. And the guy was like, fuck it's like what happened i was like oh man i brought that thing personally myself from japan it was like a super special japanese fabric something that he wanted to donate to the guy that would buy the doll was like <laughs> fuck you know i was like i was dying i was like oh my god <laughs> and you don't want to piss off the guy because the guy is the mean thai boxing guy um, <laughs> like the, yeah you don't want to piss off the guy but anyway he's an awesome guy you know he would never get pissed off but he was laughing about it but i was Fuck, I really fucked up on this one. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, dude. It was so special. And I thought, uh-huh. oh, just a piece of fabric, you know. <laughs> you know, just a whatever, you know, you something to wrap. this guy. Yeah, stuff. something. No, I, was, I thought it was something just to use to wrap it. I told you, people send me all sort of stuff. I was like, damn, Steph, think about it before doing things. Yeah. yeah. So I really ap- apologize again, Aaron. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. That's hilarious. Yeah. And you're kind of talking about this, uh, doing things for other people. And this project was... Essentially, for other people, you raised quite a bit of money to donate to children. Yeah. At first, it started as a... When I was talking about the organic development of the idea, at first, it was just a silly idea, and then I wanted to involve people from the shop, and then I wanted to involve other people, and then in one week, I had almost 100 people joining. Yeah. And we're talking in these 100 people, names like Chris Garver, Juan Puente, Mm -hmm. like Scott Sylvia, you know, like these guys, like Paul Dobleman, you know. And uh, and that was already mind-blowing. So it, it became mostly the art project, which it was started mainly as my idea of just putting people together because that was what's behind, really. Mm-hmm. And then it became that, and then it evolved, and then it became, you know, the idea of the exhibition. And then I thought, you know what, what about if this can be an instrument, can be a tool to give something back? Mm-hmm. Because I've always been really aware of this, and I always tried in my little contribution, but I've always been aware of the fact that I want to give something back because this business... It's a, it's a good business. It's a good lifestyle and this and that. In the last years, it opened up. It used to be a closed world. Now it's open. And I'm thinking, okay, this world, this business, this trade is giving you a lot because it is. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the possibility of traveling, you know. What are you giving back to the business? That's the point. You know, like if you see this out of your own egotistic point of view and be like, okay, what do I get out of it? You know, mm-hmm. what are you giving back to the thing? They're giving you so much. And 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 I've always been aware of, like, okay, I want to give something back. I don't want to be the guy to just take. Mm-hmm. Because of that and because of, I told you, my own philosophy, my own way of saying things, I'm like, okay, how can we give back to the business? And perhaps, even on a higher level, how can we give back to the world? Mm-hmm. It became kind of natural to to think, oh, you know what? Maybe we could raise some money and, and give it to charity or something. You know? And then the charity was Save the Children because the Matryoshka was born as a toy for kids. Mm-hmm. So it felt kind of like natural. And people was very responsive because the tattoo community is, is open to those things. And especially, I was talking about this recently, the the reason as well why people is so open to this kind of mentality of giving is that perhaps tattooers uh, normally come from a medium class or even less mm-hmm. normally. Nowadays, it's a bit different, right? You can have like the, the kid with a good family coming from art school, but because it was different, it was more like a outcast and stuff like that so you come from reality of middle class or less because you grew up like that you're more aware of what it is to be 
in not a good situation, mm -hmm. you know? So they're aware of the need for giving. This is just my, my interpretation, sure. I might be wrong, you know, but I'm like, maybe that's why, you know, people know, people know what it is to have troubles and problems and, you know, so people are more open to be like, okay, now I got a good, good thing going. Maybe, you know, yeah, definitely I would help, you mm -hmm. know? And I had a, an amazing response from all the artists or almost all the artists. <laughs> so they really you know, wanted to contribute and they really generously donated their dolls and their work. It wouldn't be possible without the, you know, the work. So mm -hmm. again, I, I want to thank them one by one. You're welcome. And uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you included. So yeah, we raised 15,000 pounds for Save the Children. So that was totally exceeding my, 15,000 pounds. Wow. Exceeding my expectations. So it was, was awesome. That's yeah. amazing, yeah. Yeah, man. And all of them sold. Uh yeah, apart from a couple, mm. yeah, but it's still pretty good. But it was sixty six dollars, man. Yeah. Sixty six sets, That's and, a, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, that's incredible. Let's go back because we just kind of brushed over the yokai mm -hmm. Benpack girls. Because when I first met you, you were in the middle of that project, and it was cool, kind of watching you They're produce locked. them and come up with new ones every so often. Yep. What? basically brought you to that um i started i saw that because that's the thing i didn't know much about that subject i saw it the mm -hmm. band back and then i started seeing it more from from the work of some people that i think are the are the best at the moment in those things like regultron acetates bart bingham mm -hmm. randy hall they do like very very nice one mm -hmm. i was like oh my god and then i realized you can do that with those things jesus mm -hmm. you know so i started playing with the idea and I and I started drawing them, and I really had a lot of fun. So I was doing just because it was fun. So on the train back from work and stuff. Mm -hmm. And one day, I can remember where I was coming from, maybe from a trip. And I was feeling like, oh, I would love to paint today. But I don't want to start a painting, because you know what it is to start a painting mm -hmm. with an A. You need to plan the whole thing. It's big. And I was like, no, I just want to paint for like two, three hours, something simple, just you know, to enjoy the painting. I'm like, what can I do? I was like, okay. So I had one of those ready which was a Hanya band bag, which is a band bag that looks like a Hanya. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got this drawing, I'm going to paint this one. Cool, yeah, no problem. So I painted it, and, and I had a lot of fun, and I painted it. I wanted to make it quicker. I, I'd been talking with Paul Doblman in the last convention that I w I'd been at at the time, which was Aachen. Mm -hmm. Paul, why do you paint everything now in black, like his old flashes? Because it's quicker. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I already have anyway all, my, all the colors in my head, so I don't need to make it in colors. I can produce more. I was like, oh, that's very smart. That's mm -hmm. very clever. So I'm like, okay, I want to do that. So it's quicker, but I don't want to do, you know, like him. So I'm going to do black and gray with a color, with yeah. a twist. So that's why I introduced Umbra, which is that kind of like a vintage brown and uh, uh, ochre. Mm -hmm. I did that. I was like, oh, look, that was very fun, you know, and it was fairly quick. I did another one, but for some reason, I started doing it on the only paper that I had at home, which was this arches, but was like very big. It was like A2. So I made another one. And then I was like, you know what? I could make a poster. If I fill the whole thing, it would be nice. I'll make a print. Nice. Because I started with the Hanya, okay, maybe I keep it on the Japanese subject. So what would be another traditional subject? Mm, oni. Cool, I'll make an Oni. And then I'm like, oh, I need, I need to fill this whole page. Okay, now I need to research. Mm -hmm. So you see what I talk about when I say organic grow. Yeah, it's yeah. not planned from the start. It's just like I do one step. How can I do the second? Oh, now I need to do this. And, I, you know. mm -hmm. and then so I fill the whole thing with Japanese and I need to do some research because then eventually I run out of Hanya, Oni, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, okay, what's next? Oh, yokai. Okay, I need to research a yokai. So then I went into the Tsukumogami, you know, like the old percept object things and this and that. And then I filled the old page. I told you, I, I, I'm a bit megalomaniac, always thing being. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to make six of those posters. And without thinking how long that would take, I keep working on those. And then eventually I was at uh, Royal talking with Henning. You know what? That would be cool to make something else, maybe like a book. And then he introduced me to Andre from Quintaro Publishing. Yeah. We talked about it. You always have good input. So he told me, oh, you could do this, you could do that. Then it, it became a project. Okay, we are going to make a book because I thought it would be nice to give some explanation about the characters. Sure. Because some people maybe don't know it. There's some specific yokais, which for those who don't, don't know, yokai is like this general term for all these folk, Japanese uh, spirits, uh, demons, supernatural phenomena. He gave me a deadline. We came up with a, with a strategy. And the thing is, the deadline was fairly short for the amount of work because the whole thing, it took about 300 hours. And that was over six months, which means that 
I would work every day, not every day, at the time I was working four days a week because of my elbow. Before work, I would paint. I would go to work in between jobs. I would paint and would go home and I would paint. Mm -hmm. In the day off, I would paint. You know what I mean? And then at the end of it, I need to write the text because in the book, I wrote the, the explanation about each character in English and Spanish. So you had to do research. We took a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So that's how it came out. You know? mm -hmm. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It was fun watching you do it. Yeah, it was It was a nice journey, man. Yeah. It was a nice journey, definitely. Do you have any other new projects on, underway? I have a lot of new projects. Yeah. yeah like, as I did, I did this Matrioska thing. And then realistically when people do things like this they have teams to do that because it's so much work i did all by myself wow. and that was like draining mm -hmm. and i did everything while being on the road on the road it's, it's insane. tattooing no tattooing not having a home changing country every week so that was draining i got to the end because i'm a masochist while running an exhibition i'm working as well the london convention and i'm managing 12 people that can visit over the weekend so it was <laughs> insane so after that i'm done mm -hmm. but then you know, everybody like my good friend Zaneb, she was like, you got to take a rest. Mm -hmm. You're right, but I already have an idea for next year. So now I have five more projects. Wow. Let's see which one would happen, which one will not. But mm -hmm. I told you, I, can't, I just can't stop it. You know, just like I need to feel this creative flow Yeah. before before it just fades. I especially like the projects where, you know, you have more than one artist, like a, a group type yeah, of Yeah, that, that's a more fun, mm -hmm. the more enjoyable because it's a... It's a creative force made by a collective. Yeah. You know? And you were a part of the... Um, the dot Freemasons. <laughs> the Freemasons. <laughs> yeah. The Reclaim the Dots. Yeah. 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 I, I have a painting in there as well. Yeah. I saw the, the book just came out. Just I'm came out. I'm curious to see the book, man. I'm very excited. And it's made by uh, Ash, mm -hmm. which is a very great guy from a Stronghold in Cardiff. And he, he owns these atonement books. Yes. I was working there like a few months ago. And he's very nice guy, very passionate about books. Mm -hmm. So his publishing is very, very nice. Yeah. So yeah, it's the atone Atonement Books. Uh, they have an Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then Reclaim the Dots is the other Instagram. Yep. It was funny because I found out about him because he kept on posting really cool tattoos that I yep. liked and they all had dot and i joked around i like i would send him messages and i said I, i'm i'm just gonna put dots on my rocks just so i could be on yeah. this page <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah he's a very passionate guy yeah yeah bjorn but I, yeah i'm really looking forward to see that book yeah me too it just came out yeah there's a lot of great artists that i look up to are in that as well where can we find you in the future you you've traveled you know everything the, the thing is i'm all, literally the moment at least i'm all over the place mm -hmm. because i said i change country every week yeah it's funny when people are like so what have you been it's more like what i have not <laughs> like, <laughs> so i think the the best way is to to check the instagram because sometimes i even myself i don't remember it <laughs> so i'm gonna go actually this monday in two days i'm going to new zealand for a couple of months for the new plymouth convention and then I'm coming back for the Paris Convention. And then I'm going to start over my tour, which will be all over Europe. And are you going back to the same places? In uh, same menu. Same, same menu. Because there are some places that I really like. Because I like the people. I like the I got customers. And I love the country or whatever. Mm -hmm. Extra reason. And new places, obviously, to to keep feeding this you know, inspiration. You know? Yeah. But definitely it's going to be another busy route yeah. through the next year. Yeah. My goodness. How is it planning that? Is it stressful? Is it fun? It is a little bit because the planning itself, it really, it's almost like a, a job on itself mm -hmm. because you need to sit down and make sense to this where it's going to practically work, you know, because of the flights, because of the time, because of the availability of the customers and the shops. There's a lot of things to keep in mind. But before having a, a bit more of a stable life in Scandinavia for the last five years, I've been on the road for like almost eight years in a row hmm. no house just a backpack seven eight years in a row so i got that kind of like under control mm -hmm. so it, it is stressful but because i've done it so much now i kind of have a system so it's not too bad right yeah that's awesome well i appreciate you coming thank and, you for having me man i look forward to seeing you again and same, same. Uh, hopefully in paris yes i'm calling it don't time. be you don't be too busy in paris okay? yeah man I'm, I'm like a working <laughs> horse at conventions man but uh you guys have to come to florence yeah. We had to make that trip uh, happen. I need to go back. Yeah, man. I would love to. That'd be sweet. I'm going to bring to a place where you can eat cannoli. 
Mm. It's fucking delicious. <laughs> yeah, man. Delicious. All right. We'll keep in touch and then uh, make a plan and we'll make it happen. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers, bro. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much.